Ember's turn. Ember, my God, is coming up third. They're moving up fast into the far turn. And they're up and running. Up and running. Oh, they're up and running. Uh, give me, please, before you do that, please, please, you've got 45 minutes to reset that. Before you do that, I want some sweet, beautiful, how fantastically in love I am with myself music. And now, once again, this is Mr. Chucky reporting with a brief note from the world of narcissism. Oh, this is so lovely. Oh, I love the ballet. I should have been a dancer. Inside me, there is a light nymph flying ever and ever on gauzy, diaphanous wings. And now we have, in tonight's tonight's milestone in the world narcissism we have this lovely note which comes from a shampoo advertiser in this week's ad of the week it shows a lovely girl with the most delightful coiffure it reminds me of the sort of thing that dickie does and it reads underneath it, she's looking at it as with the most devilish little look in her eyes. She says, now I don't need the moon or stars or anything, cause the best thing in life is me. Oh, my dear, you're saying it for all of us. And this has been Mr. Chucky reporting with our weekly minute fingernail pink capsule on things around the town. Gee, it's very exciting, isn't it? Get all started like that? Let's see. I don't need the moon or stars or anything. Don't put that away. I think we use that little lighter there. Uh, don't need the moon or stars or anything, because the best thing in life is me. Me, me, me. Wonderful me by George. <laughs> Oh, isn't it great? Here. Hi, George. Best thing in life is me. Oh, while we're on the subject of the... <laughs> it was that an angry call from the transmitter there. Having a little trouble out there in master control, keeping me in a pure trapezoidal pattern. So anybody out there throws a scope on us here? Hey, for any of you rotten guys that record our show all the time and send it all over the country, hi, George. I'm going to start charging you percentages and everything, a whole bit. Yeah, I should. I should, really. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I keep getting letters from guys in Cleveland and in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and, uh, and Lancaster, England, all kinds of places saying, my friend sends me tapes of your program all the time, and we here at the cheapy radio station play them. <laughs> oh, if after ever found out about you guys. All right, the best things in life are me. Uh, you just stick around. You keep that right up there, because we are going to use that. We are going to use that. We have just started. Do you know, do you know, Tony, that uh, things are moving ahead very, very strongly, and, I, and I'm glad to watch that. It's going to be that next, so just hold it there. Things are moving ahead on all fronts. And for those of you who are interested in the things are moving ahead on all fronts department, tonight we report that in Fort Lauderdale, there is a new organization known as the Conservative Non-Communist Bookstore. But you can't get loving when there ain't any love. Oh, you can't get loving when there ain't any love. Yes, sir. Well, we salute the Conservative Non-Communist Bookstore. Uh, that's a movement ever upward, ever onward. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, of course, I, I, uh, it's very good. It fits right in there, and that's a good guy. You want to hear that guy again? One, two, three. You can get water where there ain't any well. Oh, you can hear water where there ain't any well. 
If you are interested in to keep that up there, we might need that in the ever upward and onward department. Uh, I noticed that uh, the credits on the Dr. Kildare show with Raymond Massey there, at the end it says Dr. Leonard Gillespie, M.D., comma, F.A.C.P., comma. What is it with, the, with Gillespie? Is he going back to school and got himself? I remember when old Dr. Gillespie was, he's a specialist now, you know, of course, F.A.C.P., uh, and no, it has nothing to do with public accountants. It's, it's nothing to do with a protest group. It's something else. This is FACP. has to do with <laughs> College of Pediatricians. And I'm sorry about that because I can remember old Dr. Gillespie when he was played by Lionel Perrymore saying things like this. Kill it! Kill it! Don't tell me you've been listening to the specialist. <laughs> Let me tell you, kill it! The most difficult of all specialties is, is the general practitioner. That's the most difficult of all specialties because you're dealing with mankind instead of a liver. <laughs> Specialist bar, humbug. The old son of a gun has gone back to school, got himself on a couple of extra degrees, and now he charges four times more what he used to charge. And what is he, a pediatrician, a baby doctor? Uh, naturally, that touches him out in Cleveland, I'll tell you that. Oh, boy. Somehow, I just can't see Raymond Massey as a pediatrician. <laughs> For those of you who are interested in the medical world, I wonder how many of you know what Dr. Fu Manchu took his degree in. Seriously. And where did he go to school? I will provide you with the brass figligi with bronze oak leaf palm if you are conversant with that sort of information, which I'm sure many of you aren't. What? Oxford? No, no. No, no, no. It might surprise you that, no, it might surprise you it was a much lesser known institution. And uh, what he took his degree in would really surprise you. And don't come up and start saying inhumanities. Come on, come on, we're way ahead of you. The world is full of a number of slobs. And uh, <laughs> all of them are listeners. While we're on the subject of, uh, of that, uh, let's get on that subject. You know, uh, it is quite true, though, that sweeping this country, if anything can sweep it, is the... Uh, what is best for me is best for the whole world business. It's just, it's, uh, that, that, that ad so beautifully typifies it. I don't need the star, I don't need the moon, I don't need the sun, I don't need anything, cause the best thing in life is... M-E, you just guessed it. <laughs> and the chick, of course, is looking over the shoulder of some poor, unsuspecting man who is kissing her arm. Oh, poor guy. If that isn't the typical male position today in this world, isn't it, though? Did you see that? The, I, 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 was, I was amazed. I, I was looking at, the, at one of the TV shows on the weekend, and, uh, and boy, if a psychologist could have a field day, really, with many of these shows. You know that on this show, on a, uh, believe me, on a, on a, on a nationwide uh, television show, because uh, there's a lot of overtones. I know there are tones going on. On this nationwide TV show, a guy, a man, I get this, a man sang the song, It's so nice to have a man around the house. It's so nice to have a man around the house. They come in so handy at night and so dandy. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, believe me, I haven't seen that done until one... Uh, I'll never forget the Shishi Review one time that, that inadvertently I was, I was bilked into going to see five minutes before it was raided by the feds. They came down there and squirted them with flamethrowers, and the last act I remember was a guy singing, It's so nice to have a man around. Well, this was on a nationwide television show. <laughs> Did you see it? Well, not only that, it was followed by an act in which this very elderly lady dancer came out of the muscular type, and she, she danced, 
Now, you remember, you remember it used to be when, when Fred Astaire would dance and the chorus girls would dance behind him? Do you remember those halcyon days? And he would wear a high hat, you know, and he would, he would, he, and the chorus girls were there was a chorus line. Well, of course, that's all by the boards now in the new, the, the, the roles have been entirely reversed. And now muscular lady dancers come out and they dance in the middle and behind them is a row of very thin, wiry young boys all dressed in very strange looking clothing and they are the new chorus girl line, comedy chorus line. Da, 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 da. And they're dancing like, what's the matter? That's, you want to hear that? Oh, it's all right. That's, that's what, exactly what we want, Walls of the Flowers. It all fits in there because it describes so much of our world. Now, um, Oh boy, speaking of sensitive flowers, this is WOR AM at FMsville, New York. And uh, whew, we'll be here until, uh, well, you know. <laughs> oh, come on, this is the far more sensitive WBAI in New York. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I'm curious. Uh, that, that was, a, I, I watched that, you know, I watched that show, and I was really, really impressed by this because. Uh, it is, it's only within the last six or seven, maybe, maybe six or seven months, but of course the, the trend has been growing. It's only within this past year or so that the, that the actual uh, exchange of roles between the male and the female has become a formalized institution, literally. Uh, I don't know uh, how much driving you do around. One of the more intriguing aspects of this time and place is in the exchange of role in everyday life in, in America. Now, I ride, for the most part, a motor scooter around. It's really not a motor scooter. I'm sorry, I shouldn't use that term. It's a motorcycle. I ride a motorcycle around, and when you drive a motorcycle around the streets of New York, you have a much closer contact with the traffic <laughs> in many ways, I'll tell you, than you, than you ever do riding in a car. Most, mostly, most people, when they ride a car, are just vaguely aware of this large vehicle, this, this block of metal, but this side, that side, you know, they drive along, and the car goes along on a pretty straight line course, and driving an automobile is a, is a pretty cotton-dried operation. But a motorcycle, on the other hand, is, is first of all, hated by everybody in, uh, in cars. I'm sure for a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons. But boy, I'll tell you, more, more insane hatreds by ordinarily sane people come out the minute they see somebody who is not behaving the way they behave. That's like riding a cab, you know, that's, that's considered absolutely nutty that, you know. Do you know that I would say, I like to talk to a cabbie, but I would be willing to bet, you know, speaking of the reversal of roles, that the cab used to be a thing that was really a, a thing for businessmen, the hurried guys. I would say probably a good 75% of cab riders today are angry chicks sitting in the back seat. I, I believe it, and I tell you this, by riding around the streets of New York constantly, and when you're driving a motorcycle, you are not only aware of the car, you are aware of everything about that car because you better be. Uh, one thing you get really attuned to when you ride a motorcycle is sounds of cars. You can tell whether a car is going to be dangerous or not, often by the sound of it. You really can. Uh, there's a lot of things you learn, but one of the most, uh, I think, probably significant things is, is the number of people today. I'd say by far the majority of cars today are driven by women with a man sitting beside them. They have completely reversed their roles. And, and, uh, one <laughs> and I, think, I think something that is really funnier, really, now uh, that you can excuse that the wife is picking up the tired businessman. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the date, the obvious date. And you see this, this, this steel-jawed chick sitting in the front seat on Friday nights when you're riding along. And boy, I'll tell you, they're insane when it comes to motorcycles. They, they hate motorcycles. Somehow the motorcycle is a, is a peculiarly masculine statement that really bugs this type. But oh yeah, oh yeah, I was almost killed by a couple of chicks in a car who did exactly, I'll tell you how far the reversal of roles has come. Do you remember the old 47 Mercury diner nut, the Marty, the diner Marty? 
You know, the guys that we used to drive with, with the tails, the squirrel tails flying in the back and the radio going and nine antennas on the thing and the decals over the side and they always go, What are you doing, you wise guy? You want to fight? You know, that kind of stuff. They're yelling up and down. You know, the New Jersey syndrome. You see them up and down. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the, I think that's a good percentage of the population of Jersey. You see them riding up and down the streets of New York on a Friday night. The poor, sad idiots. But they are. They're all over. Now you find the female version of that. The first time I've noticed that. Yeah, these chicks wearing leather jackets. Of course, the, the scene has been going on for years, but in a different way. But now they have completely taken the role. I'm riding along on my, my motorcycle, and you know, I'm just going along, and there's a car behind me and to my right. You know, you see, you, you know where everything is, and we're on a one-way street, namely 2nd Avenue. And we're going down 2nd Avenue, and I'm going along, just going from light to light. And without any warning, my ears pick up this, you know, the sound of the tires doing it. And sure enough, out of the corner of my eye, I see this thing coming like a bat out of hell across my bow. These chicks are just cutting me off with the sheer kicks of it. They go, and I go, you know, I'm pretty good on that little motorcycle now. See, so they, they, they couldn't really do it. They couldn't throw me up on the sidewalk. But I'm, and these chicks, this chick, what do you think you are, Mom and Brandon? Marlon Brando, buddy! Ha-ha! Marlon Brando, buddy! Waltz of the Flowers, please. Following this little feminine diatribe. <laughs> so I holler, baby, you wanna fight? Come on back, you idiots! And they holler, all right! And they're starting to get out, you know, I was ready to go. <laughs> Sadly enough, they chickened out. It would have been the first true fist fight. <laughs> Colleen Dewhurst world. Oh, boy. It's a it's a it's a funny scene. Uh, what's all that? Uh, I can't read a thing. Bring it over here now, don't you? You know that I love this kind of stopping everything in the middle of it to give you some trivial information. Uh, big hit record, Sarah Vaughan singing Stella. What's this? What's so funny about that? Stella by Starlight. Sarah Vaughan singing Stella by Starlight. I see. <laughs> I see what you mean, yeah, oh yeah, 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 of course, uh, sad, sick world. Well, I don't know, I don't know whether Sarah has her problems or not, but I'll tell you, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Sarah Watson singing Stella by Starless, big hit record. Well, I, I, uh, I, it's true that there's been all kinds of little in-jokes like this for a long time, but to have it come out this big, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to have a man about the house. And I thought, oh boy, wowee. And, and, I, and I'm sure that the guy who was, was, was uh, w w the saddest ramifications of it all, I'm sure that the poor clown who was singing it had no idea of the in-joke he was perpetrating because... <laughs> and then another one, I, I, read a, I read a movie starlet, is... Uh, she is, she is uh, quoting, uh, she's talking about the 10 most eligible bachelors in Hollywood. Well, honey, I hate to disillusion you, but out of that 10 most eligible bachelor list, there are seven of them at least that are not eligible for any... <laughs> just forget them, honey, uh, just forget it. But uh, this, is a, this, this is a tough situation. I don't know, you know where it's going to stop. But these chicks cutting across in front of me, with, uh, I thought was, was really a was really a new thing. But on Friday night, uh, if you ride around the town a great deal, you will find that, that the uh, greatest percentages of, of the cars, and a large percentage, I not say the greatest, but a tremendous percentage of cars are driven by the girl girls who are taking the guy on a date. They, they literally are. It's, it's quite obvious that they are the ones that are providing the car, and they have picked the date up. And, and, and this recessive may affect everything. Well, I'm, I'm looking for the corsage on the, on the cummerbund uh, very shortly, you know. <laughs> <I'm really laughs> oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's coming. There's a lot of stuff is coming. Uh, but but uh, let's see, we got a thing here. We better, we better put this on the air before we go any further. This is getting a little... A little oh, speaking of, uh, of a lot of things are coming, for those of you who haven't heard the news, uh, as of the 10th of February, maybe you, you didn't know about it, Tony, our, the show is going to be moved up to 10.15. I will be on from 10.15 until 11 as of the, uh, as of the 10th of February. Now, there, there are many reasons for this. One of the most important reasons for it is that 
that there are countless numbers of people we have found, and I, this has been all kinds for years, who go to college and one thing or another and just cannot stay up till midnight to listen. And so we're moving up from, from now until 10.15, and 10.15 till, till 11 as of the 10th. And by the way, one more thing I must say. I, I'm, I'm amused at all the number of letters from people who, uh, who have objected. You know, they're writing and say, well, now we can't, uh, we can't listen to you anymore because of the, of the TV shows that come on at 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh boy well my only feeling is that that if if what i have to offer what little it might be is of any importance to you you won't mind a little uh inconvenience and if you do well goodbye and hail for hail what is it hail fellow well met so <laughs> there's a great army term we have to it too and i'd love to say here in the air but it's a little bit late or is it early? I don't know if it's late or early for those early. Oh, yes, uh, on, on the subject of, uh, of this, this whole phenomenon of, um, of me, the greatest thing in the world is me, uh, you're, you're finding that this is beginning to take place in every area. And, and one of the most subtle areas of all, hail and farewell, that's it, very good. Hail and farewell. To those of you who can't follow me to 11.15, from 11.15 to 10, hail and farewell, it's been nice knowing you. But uh, don't, don't immediately write to me, as most everybody says, poor W.O.R., they're, they're shoving you around again. They are not. As a matter of fact, the reason, uh, is a very important reason, is that they have found that there, is, there are roughly double the number of radio sets that are on at 10.15 as they're on at 11.15. In other words, there's just that many people who have to get up at 6 in the morning who can't sit around and listen to jazzy jokes between 11.15 and midnight. But, nevertheless, that's the story. Now, you know, speaking of, uh, I must get back to this thing, because it, I, it hasn't really been recorded yet as much as it should be. Uh, guys have written endless numbers of books on the pyramid climbers and the status seekers and all that sort of thing. But I think one of the most interesting phenomena of our time, and, and probably more, more significant than all the rest of the corporate business and the thing of the status and the other directed and the interdirected crowds and the lonely crowds and all the rest of it that books have been written endlessly on and plays have been written about is the growth of meism, uh, which is, is a very subtle thing, and it's so subtle that uh, sometimes it's often difficult to detect. For example, there was a, there was a recent article, and this takes many forms, many forms. Uh, there was a recent article in the Saturday Evening Post, and the, the article was about, uh, actually, it was about poverty. It was about poverty in America, and, it, and it, uh, p particularly among certain sections of our society. Uh, and the article was called The Invisible Americans, and it, uh, it was about migrant workers and American Indians and so on, people who just were not able to work in our society and were really in dire, tremendous poverty, and something had to be done about it. Well, well. Here is a here's a here's a here's an uh, an answer a letter, which I thought should be conveyed to show this meism growing. Here's an answer, and he says, "What is your magazine trying to do?" This is a letter to the editor. What is your magazine trying to do? Undermine the peace of mind with socialist or big government propaganda? Everyone knows that in a capitalist economy where everyone follows his own profit-making motive, all society will automatically benefit. In there, at that point, I will insert, oh yeah. It is the duty of our business leaders to automate for higher profits. If a few million inefficient people don't fit, well, survival of the fittest, you know. <laughs> I won't even give this guy. Now, now, I presume, of course, what he, this is, a, this is a political philosophy, by the way, that's being expressed by many people today. If they don't make it too bad, there's another way of putting it. I got mine, now you'll get yours, buddy. Well, uh, this is a new thing, really. Oh, it's always been with us, but it has not yet uh, in our society achieved the respectability that it has today. So don't come around and say, well, it's, people have always been that Sure, they've always been that way, but they've always had to be sneaky about it. They've always had to say it to themselves, you know, oh, no, no, hell with him, you know. But when you have a giant political slogan that literally says that, then you've got something else going. And, uh, and I, it's got all kinds of ramifications. Now, uh, I, I suppose, of course, that, uh, that this letter writer has plans uh, to, uh, to get rid of these, quote, few million inefficient, unfit people. Uh, 
<laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there was another society I, I remember that had a thing they called the ultimate solution when they had a lot of people that they claimed didn't fit into their society. So, so you know, it, it, there, there are all kinds of things are beginning to develop. Now, 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 one of the most, I, to me, one of the most amusing facets of this deification of the selfish person in our time is in the show business world. Now, again, don't, don't accuse me of being too much involved with show business, because I'm not. What I am interested in, though, is the theater and the, the TV world, in short, show business world, as, in a way, reflecting the true mores of a country, as opposed to the stated ones in sermons. Uh, and in editorials and the New York Times and all this, that, that the real thing is being done right under our noses, and the thing that we applaud and laugh at is the thing we really believe in. That's the thing we believe in. Now, the, the, the stuff we write in the big ponderous editorials, forget it. This is the kind of stuff that guys have been carving in stone forever, you know? And all the while, the, the maces are rising and falling off stage, and guys are, are, are wringing each other's necks. And all the while, they're carving stuff like, Justice is all! And great big stone axes. Well, forget the, uh, the stuff that's carved in the stone walls. Look around. Now, now, I'll give you an example of that. More and more in our theater, if you've, if you've been going to the theater, you, you, you'll see some of these, that the guy which originally was vilified in American fiction, in other words, he was he was pointed out as a real rotten so and so, and he was he was he was uh, he was the man that the man who wrote was angry about. More and more, he's achieving the status of a hero, and he's applauded. Now, I'm not talking about the lovable villain, not at all. I'm talking about something else, that that his very actions are applauded, and the people who oppose him, who in a sense are honest or try to play the game right are always pictured as boobs, idiots, fools and, and phonies that if you don't cheat you're called the real phony in, in business that's, that's a new term you see. it's a new way to do it and uh, in and, and, and short the guy that does not break the law is, ah, he's a phony he wants to break the law but he doesn't that's real phoniness that's real phoniness well now I've seen several examples of these one of, one of the most recent examples is, is in How to Succeed Without Trying. You know this one with Robert Morris? Here was a guy that if you knew him in the office, you'd gladly kill him. You'd gladly slice his throat from ear to ear. But the reason you cheer him is because 90% of the audience is, is, believes that. They work that way. They phony it all the way on up, you know. And so they sit there and applaud. Oh, hey, Bobby, oh, author, author. And, and they're going like mad because the 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 uh, the guy who is the 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 absolute phony rises to great heights and finally takes over the business, and everyone's glad at the end that he did because it seemed that he was the the good one, he was the right one. And I can tell you this: that the guy that originally wrote the book of, upon which this was based was using this character to show you how rotten so many people are in our world. It was truly satire. He was not approving of this guy's, of this guy's modus operandi. Uh, oh yes, uh, the, the, to apply very strong morality to other people. To, to really demand absolute morality uh, on people, other people, and to allow yourself the widest possible latitude of morality, and call it freedom. Uh, is, is, is one of the more moving aspects of this kind of double think which is, which is prevalent and which can be found in, in many, of the, many of the plays, many of the dramas and so on today. If you notice that today, almost invariably, the, uh, the person who breaks the law or, or is, is the murderer winds up in one way or another being the hero or at least the one with the sympathy. He's, he's the one that you sympathize with. Uh, this is a worldwide, uh, a worldwide phenomenon and is growing to almost uh, unbelievable bounds. So I suspect that in the end, uh, that the only people who will be the really bad people in a society will be the people who object, you know, say to killing, or uh, they object to uh, people hitting each other. Now remember this though, that, that most of the people who are, who are the great moralizers of today do object to killing, and they object to violence and hitting and one thing or another, but they don't object to it if the right side does it. Uh, they only object to it on one side, generally. 
uh, this is this is a part of the, I suppose, that dual morality. But it's it's fascinating. I, I, I'd love to see Steve Lawrence playing Sammy Glick. I remember Sammy Glick. Uh, uh, gee, I, I can think of a lot of great books that you can bring back. Uh, I wonder what would happen if they tried to make remake, say, uh, Dracula today. Uh, sure. Oh, oh, yeah. Who would you get for Dracula? Let's see. Gee, Tony Curtis would be good. He's very pale in a lot of pictures anyway. You could just spray a little white paint on him. He'd be a great Dracula, wouldn't he? he really, <laughs> very good. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 I guess nobody wants to be loathed today. Uh, and, and no one wants to admit that there is such a thing in our world as evil, especially if it has to do with making the scene. If it has to do with making, making your own pile, there can't be any evil. Uh, the only kind of evil that we will recognize today are the great generalized evils, like, uh, oh, uh, hate. We talk about hate. Uh, we talk about things that we use these things so easily. And yet, I wonder whether Sammy Glick hated. You know the book at all? Well, it is my thesis that Sammy Glick was one of the prime haters of all time, in the most subtle of all possible ways. And yet, uh, that kind of hate is not really put down anymore. Uh, yes. Yeah, he was the greatest hater of all time. That's, as a matter of fact, why Bud Schulberg uh, laid him down the way he did. And, and uh, that's why, I, I suppose, uh, I'm sure that if, uh, did you see Elmer Gantry? Well, did you notice that you couldn't help kind of loving old Elmer as he was played by uh, Burt Lancaster, who did a good job in it. Lancaster, uh, I think, did a good job. But he sure didn't, uh, he didn't bring out the evil that is in the Gantry. Oh, no. And there are plenty of those gantries around. Uh, have, have, really, have, have, from, you go back, and, and the kind of hatred, not hatred really, but the, 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 uh, the anger that, that a guy like Lewis put into writing this book, of course, was dissipated by the color screen. And it was dissipated by the kind of engaging performance that a man like Lancaster can't help giving because he's an engaging actor. Uh, then, then you go on to, of course, I'm sure he didn't try to do that, but there it is, he did it. Uh, there have been others. Now, let's see. I wonder how they would do today, say, uh, talk about the, some of the great evil people of all time. I wonder how they would do some of the more uh, colorful passages of, say, Jonathan Swift's work. Uh, let's take in, in Gulliver's Travels. Uh, I did. Did you see the cartoon version of Gulliver's Travels a few years ago? Did you see that? You should have, because it was an example of Walt Disneyism at its worst. Uh, <laughs> and, and yet, you couldn't help but love. Even the even the even the Yahoos, you know, were kind of lovable. But <laughs> boy, that would have would have popped Swift's cork. I'll tell you that in spades. Uh, and, and yet, we 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 because uh, you see, uh, we 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 don't like the kind of satire. We we all talk about satire, but we really don't want satire anymore. We want, we want moralizing. We want, we want the, we want always satire to apply to the other idiots. We really do. Uh, when real satire ever shows up, believe me, it, 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 it never is really commercial, and it causes fist fights. It, uh, it does not get approved by the New York Times, and genuine satire is never done on television. I can tell you that. <laughs> not really, uh, because satire, you see, is talking about people. Hence, it would get everybody mad. We call satire when we're talking about a single individual or a single incident. So if, if I come on and do a satire on the AMA, for example, that's called satire. But if you do a satire on people, literally, uh, on the kind of attitudes that people have, you will find that, uh, that in general, love is, is not one thing you're going to get, or applause, or agents. Uh, and and uh, if, if I'm, I'm sure that if, if uh, How to Succeed was done with the slashing, wildly bitter, satirical sense that was through Shepard Mead's work, which was anti that guy. I hope you know that. It was anti this character. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a book that would make a good uh, a good uh, musical on that score. If you want to, if you want to water down life, is the book that William H. White wrote. I forget the name of it now, a couple of years ago. And one of the great chapters that White wrote 
was a chapter in which he discussed on, on how, if you were going into an office, on how to beat all the psychological placement tests, how, how to answer the things that they know. Did you know they, for example, if you're given a question that says, what would you rather do? Go to church, go to a ball game, read a book, watch television, or go to the Playboy Club? Which one are you supposed to answer if you're going to be a healthy individual of our time? Right! You hit it. You'd make a... That's right. Oh, George. <laughs> and you'd bring your little key with you. Uh, and, and, and yet, if you really answered it truthfully, you're going to be put down as a nut. Generally. Really. Especially if you write down... Read a book. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sick, introspective, non non-crowd-oriented uh, individual who will be a lot of trouble in sales meetings. <laughs> and yet, I'm sure that if they did it on, on the musical stage, he would come out looking great doing this stuff. And yet this character was satirized by White as being, a, you know, a product of our world. The double thinker, the double talker, newspeak, I guess, is the best way to put it. Newspeak, new think, new world, New swing. Ah, uh, indeed. Well, now we have, now we have a date from listening carefully to the complete show. Sometime January or February of 1963. One of Rudy's earliest air checks, and they keep pouring in. So, next week, I don't know. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll dig out that Beatles stuff and do a Beatles special. begin at the here and now, or does the story start with the first time my mother took the wheel, the first woman to drive in a country where men are afraid to walk? My mother's story begins when the steam rises. On Monday, March 2nd, a special edition of The Power of the Word will feature Monique Trong, Barbara Tran, Maura Donahue, and Len. Yes, a swell show it was last night.